Welcome to our talk, a detailed look into the MOSI peer-to-peer -peer IoT botnet. My name is Chris Dietrich and we will present joint work with Andreas Klopsch and Raphael Springer. We are all affiliated with the Institute for Internet Security at the Westphalian University in Germany, where I am professor for computer security. From a research perspective, we focus on tracking botnets that target IoT devices. And here's our motivation why we looked at MOSI. The set of malware families can be grouped in four categories, and this is not aiming for completeness, but rather one way to structure it. With Mirai in 2016, financially motivated actors entered the IoT stage. Mirai received a lot of media attention due to significant impact of events such as DDoSing a Dyn, a large DNS provider, or taking down craps on security. Probably in an act of despair, the original authors of Mirai published their source code, probably to mislead investigations. But as a result, we have all kinds of offsprings, even appearing today, which reuse parts of the original Mirai code. Since 2018, with the publication of VPN filter, we know that IoT botnets are also subject to espionage tooling, uh, most likely used in nation state uh, backed activities, um, at least given the FBI's in, uh, attribution of VPN filter to Fancy Bear. The third group is composed of destructive botnets. Uh, and that means actors aiming for sabotage. And both Brickabot and Silex are two examples of this group. And finally, we have botnets that have been active for quite some time, occasionally even years, where we still don't know the actor's intent. These are the known unknowns, if you will, and MOSI is part of this category. Hajime, for example, also belongs to this category, and while it has existed for years, the motivation of the actors behind it are still not fully understood. With MOSI, it kind of felt similar to us, so we wanted to take a closer look. What is MOSI? MOSI is a malware that targets Linux-based IoT devices, um, by far, the majority of infected devices have a MIPS processor, um, but we also see ARM, PowerPC, and there's a strong indication that uh, there is some uh, x86 as well. All our analysis is based on reverse engineering MIPS and ARM samples and tracking the botnet's command and control activity. Speaking of command and control, MOSI exhibits a pretty unique command and control where the BitTorrent distributed hash table protocol serves as a carrier protocol for command control. Um, now this may sound somewhat similar to Hajime, which also used the BitTorrent DHT, but MOSI clearly differs in many regards and uh, we will outline some of them here. The name MOSI is based on file names used in propagation. MOSI was first seen in September 2019 and initially publicly described by two researchers from uh, Chinese 360 in December 2019, so roughly one year ago. Um, and it's still actively being developed uh, and most recently had a significant outbreak in September 2020. If we take a look at the binaries, at the, the malware samples, um, they arrive as statically linked ELF binaries uh, linked to the micro C libc, which is a small um, C library and they use a custom UPX uh, unpacker uh, where the header fields are, or some header fields are zeroed out as has been previously documented by Lars Wallenborn. Let's take a look at the command and control mechanism. Botnets using BitTorrent um, are not new, but MOSI uses the BitTorrent DHT in a pretty unique way. So each node in the BitTorrent DHT has a 20 byte node ID. And typically, the whole ID is chosen randomly. However, for MOSI, the ID consists of a prefix, typically 888888, and 14 randomly chosen bytes. In the regular DHT, an XOR metric is used to compute the distance between two such hashes, but MOSI does not really make use of that. In fact, while the regular DHT forms a structured peer-to-peer -peer network, the MOSI peer-to-peer -peer network must rather be considered an unstructured peer-to-peer uh, -peer network that just happens to be implemented on top of the BitTorrent DHT. The malware uses two message types, um, namely the peerless request and a corresponding response to crawl the peer-to-peer -peer network 
and look for further MOSI peers and the ping message type to check for liveliness of peers. Given that all MOSI nodes use the same prefix, they kind of gravitate around the node ID prefix in the peer-to-peer -peer network. Now, let's say we have an established peer-to-peer -peer network uh, shown by these nodes uh, down here. How does MOSI crawl the network? If it crawls a regular BitTorrent DHT node, that means it sends a peer list request um, for a target ID, uh, which has the same prefix and some randomly chosen uh, bytes. Um, a regular DHT node will respond with a set of nodes in the network, say um, nodes C, D, and F. And this set may contain both MOSI nodes and non-MOSI nodes. However, when it crawls a MOSI node, let's say node C, um, then there are two ways that C can respond. It can either respond with a peerless response um, that is a set of peers, but in this case, the set of peers are only MOSI nodes, let's say just the node F, or it can respond with a config that is just masqueraded as a peerless response. And the interesting part here is that the choice is made at random. So with a 33% choice, on average, C will return a peerless response consisting of further MOSI nodes, and with a 66% chance, it will return a config. And this is actually quite clever. The code that is used to implement the peer-to-peer -peer component is largely based, not completely, but largely, um, on open source code uh, called DHT Bootstrap that was initially published in 2009. Let's take a look at the config and the capabilities. And I don't really want to go into too much detail here, um, but uh, MOSI can be instructed to take part in DDoS attacks, um, can download and execute signed binaries, that's not really uh, new. But by the way, the whole config is uh, ECDSA signed, so um, yeah, it's protected. And a pretty interesting capability is the network traffic manipulation. MOSI binds a raw socket to bridge devices and manipulates DNS and plain text HTTP packets. For DNS, we believe it can, instruct, can be instructed to um, modify DNS resolutions. That means to redirect a domain you know, somewhere else, have it point to a different IP address. And with plain text HTTP, it is able to inject JavaScript. However, we have not observed any of that functionality, so neither the DDoS activity nor the uh, network traffic manipulation in the wild yet. Um, let's look at the population, right? I mean, that's what everybody's interested in. How big is it? While we've tracked it um, since the end of last year, we only show data since May uh, in this graph. Notice that the y-axis has a log scale, uh, and up until September 9th, we typically measured something between two to 4,000 unique node IDs or IPv4 addresses per 24-hour interval, possibly with a few small peaks. However, on September 10th, MOSI grew significantly and reached up to 80 to 100,000 node IDs uh, before going slightly back down to where it remains now at roughly uh, 30,000 nodes uh, in a 24-hour interval. Which brings us to the obvious next question, um, what happened on September 10th, right? And to understand that, we need to take a look at the propagation methods uh, of MOSI. MOSI can propagate in two ways. Um, it comes with 14 HTTP-based exploits for web interfaces of IoT devices, and that set of exploits has not changed over time. The second mechanism is uh, via telnet credentials. Um, so it has a hard-coded list of login prompt patterns, uh, checks, um, a set of usernames and passwords, and that set has, has changed um, over time. We specifically looked at the changes in the binaries um, surrounding September 10th, um, the day of the massive increase, and we only found three differences. Two of them affect the login prompts, 
Those are matched before usernames and passwords are even tried. And one was an additional password that was added, uh, which you see on the right, the Brahmos at 15. Now, we were not familiar with the term Brahmos, um, but this is a medium-range cruise missile um, developed by a Russian-Indian joint venture, which certainly might raise a few eyebrows. Now, don't get us wrong. Um, we can prove that the addition of this password caused the massive increase, but we just say that the only difference that we were able to find in the binaries between pre-September 10th and post-September 10th um, is this change with regard to propagation. By the way, that massive increase is also mirrored in uh, third-party measurements as well. Let's take a look at the botnet population shift over time. And there are two aspects that I would like to highlight here. This graph shows the number of distinct node IDs uh, aggregated per week by country for the five most prevalent countries. First, on September 10th, we observed that India has the majority of infections, while previously um, China suffered from the most infections. Now, given the Indian nexus of the, of the Brahmos password, this may be worth taking uh, another look. Second, and I think that's far less obvious, I'd like to point out a small increase in mid-July. Here, Georgia, um, the country, not the state, accounts for about as many infections as all of China. And notice that the y-axis is not log scale, but linear here. And um, I mean, Georgia, a country of about, I think, three and a half million inhabitants, um, you know, uh, that's somewhat uncommon. Um, and we don't really have an explanation here. But, you know, in general, I think rapid infection increases, especially in certain countries um, only, are somewhat atypical, especially for a botnet whose population otherwise seems to uh, follow the distribution of uh, vulnerable devices that, you know, it can affect. Um, however, we were not able to find any further indication for uh, targeted activity in that sense. And with that, I would like to hand over to Andreas, who is going to take you through the final part. Hello everybody, my name is Andreas Klopsch and I will take over from now. So, during our research we developed a service which assisted us in our analysis, which I would like to present to you. As already mentioned by Chris Dietrich, Mosi is packed with a custom UPX packer and has to be unpacked first in order to obtain the malicious payload. If you take a look at the Windows world, unpacking PE binaries is well researched and practically solved. Solutions already exist. If you take a look at unpacked.me, for example, where you can upload your PE binary and obtain it back in an unpacked form. However, packing appears more and more popular in the IoT malware world too, so we focused on providing a service or creating a service to dynamically unpack ELF binaries targeting the ARM architecture. The goal is to have the service up and running at iot.ethos.net by the end of 2020 for everybody to use. So how does this service look like and work on the inside? Well, you could divide it into two phases, execution and rebuilding. The input is, as already mentioned, a statically linked ELF binary targeting the ARM architecture. So in the first phase, we will emulate or execute the sample in an ARMv7 virtual machine emulated by the QEMU emulator. During execution, the sample will unpack itself and the unpacked code will lie in memory. We will take advantage of this and dump the volatile memory during execution and with volatile memory extraction the first phase is completed. So now we have a memory dump where the unpacked code is inside somewhere. The second phase will be focused on rebuilding the binary again. So first we identify the target process which would be the MOSI process for example and we extract the pages of this malicious process. So extracting pages means that we are translating its virtual addresses into the corresponding physical addresses and dump them. 
afterwards, so yeah, first of all, in order for this to work, the, the service needs additional files. So these additional files are either debugging symbols from the kernel source code or manual files, and they are needed in order to pass these, these structures from volatile memory. If you're using this service by the end of 2020, you don't need to bother about them because we are already providing them for you. So the final step is to locate the ELF header inside the process dump and rebuild it to an on-disk form by concatenating the pages in the right order again. Afterwards, you can, you can further process these, these unpacked examples, for example, to load it into IDA or GIDRA and do static analysis on them. So as already mentioned, we plan to, to, to let the service run at the end of, by the end of 2020 at iot.ethos.net where you will be able to upload your samples and we will send it back to you in an unpacked form. In the final part of this presentation, and given our limited, limited time, we would like to address at least two open issues. First of all, we did not observe any attack so far, which could be because our visibility limits us or that specific nodes may be tasked individually and we don't, we don't see this. The third reason could be that the configs are marked to not propagate. So if they are marked not to propagate, we, we, our chances to obtain them by simply crawling the P2P botnets are very slim. The second open issue is that Mozi is still in ongoing development. So in September 2020, for example, we spotted a variant of Mozi which implements a module to manipulate network traffic on a very low level. And all in all, it can be said that the possibility that the actors continue developing MOSI exists. So these are the open issues we wanted to address. And that's also it with the, with the present presentation. And finally, we would like to thank the listed organization and people for assisting us and supporting us in our analysis and in our research. And if there are any open questions, you can issue them now.